Welcome to Standing on the Word, a ministry of the South Seminole Baptist Church located at 1201 South Seminole Drive in Eastridge, Tennessee. We are a fellowship of believers dedicated to ministering to the Eastridge, North Georgia area. Here you will find an exciting children's worship and an active Awana program. Students will be challenged in Christian growth and provided times of wholesome fellowship. God's Word is taught to those of all ages. Worship services are times of praise and celebration. We invite you to join us each Sunday morning at 1045 and every Sunday evening at 6 o'clock. Now we ask you to stay with us as our pastor shares from God's Word. Allow the Lord to speak to your heart as the choir and congregation lead us in singing praises to our God. However they're defined It's not about interpretations Or the judgment of the mind It's the opposite of politics Power or prestige It's about a simple message And whether we believe Still the cross is still the blood of Calvary that makes us sin and says that that is still the name, the name of Jesus that is born to save the lost is still. Strategize and implement our stances and decrees. We can control our institutions, approve and grant degrees. But the world is out there watching, and what they need from us is to see our risen Savior reflected in our lives.
Thank you so much, Matt. Great job. Well, today we're continuing our message series, Home Improvements. And today we're going to talk about parenting. Now, as I was preparing uh, this week, I wanted to give you 10 surefire things that you can count on when raising kids. And then I thought about my own two sons and the many mistakes that I made as a father. And so I, I finally came up with seven things you might want to try. And I'm not guaranteeing they'll work. But uh, the truth is that Scripture gives us uh, some wonderful principles and guidelines to go by in every aspect of life, including parenting. So let me uh, share with you a little scenario, and, and you need to help me with it. Uh, uh, there's a young man in his 20s named Mike. And uh, you, Mike was raised in church, and you know, he was a part of the youth group, and uh, uh, he, he did what some guys do. In fact, maybe most guys, when he got to college, uh, you know, he, he got involved, you know, a little bit with uh, the party crowd, but he finally came to his senses and kind of got his life back on track, and, and now he has his first job, and, and he's, he's thinking that, you know, it would be great to, to have a wife and to have a family, and he's looking forward to that, and he, he knows three different girls. That he, he kind of thinks that if not one of these, it, at least one like one of these. And, and, and so first of all, uh, there's, there's Annie. Now, now Annie, uh, she grew up three doors down 
from where Mike was raised. And so they became good friends, even though, you know, he didn't like girls too much uh, when he first met Annie, but, you know, she didn't like boys either. And so uh, they were sort of friendly enemies, but in time, uh, they really became fast friends and, and went through uh, elementary school and middle school and high school uh, together. Uh, just really good buddies and friends. And so he likes a lot about Annie. And, and then there's, there's, there's Roxy. Now, he thinks that Roxy is Foxy. I mean, she is a looker. And uh, she can be a little high maintenance at times, but, but I mean, you know, she's so gorgeous. And, uh, you know, he just, he just uh, thinks about, you know, how great it would be to be married to, to Foxy Roxy. And, and, and then there's Mary. Now, now, he met Mary in the church youth group. And uh, they dated a little bit, uh, but nothing ever too very serious. And so uh, they sort of lost touch uh, during his college days. Uh, but he's now back in his hometown, and uh, he's, he's kind of had some contact with her again. And uh, she's, now she's cute. But, but he sees her real beauty coming from the inside. And, and so he's not sure it would be one of these three, uh, but uh, maybe someone like one of these three. But, but let me just ask you, if it were to be one of the three, Annie, uh, his boyhood friend, Foxy Roxy, or Mary, the church girl, who's cute, uh, but her real beauty is from within. So how many of you think that he should, he should go after Annie, his, his good friend? How many of you think that he should go after Foxy Roxy? How many of you think that he should focus in on Mary, the church girl? Well, I'll tell you the truth. I think he should marry someone who is his best friend, who he thinks is gorgeous, who has beauty from within. So I'm not suggesting he should marry all three, but I am suggesting that uh, as he considers perhaps the second most important decision of his life he needs to have more to go on than just friendship or good looks or whatever. So who's going to influence him as to the kind of girl he ought to marry? Well, I guarantee you his, his college buddies will. And, and I can assure you uh, that some of the people he's working with now will, will have their opinion and hopefully uh, his church life, uh, both his teen years and, and, and now his church involvement now will influence him. But my hope would be that the greatest influence in Mike's life as, as far as such a huge major decision would be his parents. Now, not that they're going to pick her out or not that they're going to say, you should marry her. But what happened in his formative years should give him clear direction as the kind of woman that would be good to be his wife and the mother of his children. Uh, so we're talking about parenting and we're, we're talking about Great parenting, influential parenting. So if you have a copy of God's Word, take it and turn to a classic parenting passage, Deuteronomy chapter 6. Deuteronomy chapter 6. Now this chapter starts out this way in verse 1. 
Now, this is the commandment, and these are the statutes and judgments which the Lord your God has commanded to teach you that you may observe them in the land which you're crossing over to possess. Uh, uh, so, the people of God are about to have a fresh start. And, and God says, now, there are some principles and guidelines that you need uh, to have and, and to take serious and to value as, as you move forward in your lives. And it just so happens in the previous chapter, Moses had laid out the Ten Commandments. That, that's the list of principles that God is talking about here. In fact, the Ten Commandments are the perfect ten for homes that win, right? I mean, the commandments tell us to worship God, uh, to have no other gods, to, to have no idols in your life. And of course, you're thinking, well, you know, I can cover the idols thing because there's no way I'm going to, you know, worship a little stone god or something like that. No, anything uh, that that you love more than God. <laughs> and, and, and that can be uh, prosperity, that can be uh, some person, that can be popularity, uh, that can be pleasure. There's a lot of different idols or gods that we can have in our lives that, uh, that we, we know that God himself would want us to do something different, but we make the wrong choice because we're actually serving another God. Well, the commandments tell us don't, don't lie and, and, and don't steal and, and be sexually pure and don't be jealous and, and honor your parents. And so these really are the perfect ten for homes that win. So look at what God's word goes on to say in verse 3. Therefore, hear, O Israel, and be careful to observe it, that it may be well with you, that you may multiply greatly as the Lord God of your fathers has promised you, a land flowing with milk and honey. And so as you think about Mike and, and think about his life, his parents wanted him to be successful, to be blessed, to, to, to multiply and, and, and <laughs> multiply in ways that doesn't have anything to do with having kids. And then look at verse 6. And these words, which I command you today, shall be in your heart. In other words, not just ten rules that we're supposed to obey in your mind, but rather in your heart, deep down in your soul, to where this is what you want to do. And, and so, in regards to Mike, uh, God's word and God's will in his heart uh, should give him clear direction as to the kind of choices he should make and the kind of a woman he should marry. And then look at verse 7. Talking to parents now. And you shall teach them diligently. Uh, these perfect ten. You shall teach them diligently to your children and talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up in other words as you do life you know just you know as you're you know cooking dinner as you're you know weeding the flower bed any time that you have interaction with your kids when you're when you're you know playing catch when you're helping with homework uh, use those as opportunities uh, to teach them about life. goes on to say, And you shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes, and you shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. In other words, values, principles to live by, the, the perfect ten. Uh, should be a priority in your life, 
in your heart, in your parenting, in your home. So how do you do that? How do you do that? It's easy to say, well, we should teach our children the words and the will of God. Well, that's true. But how do you do that? So what I want to do is to quickly give you some helps, some things that great parents do. Now, I have learned through trial and error, mostly error, that what I'm about to share with you works. I didn't always do this. I, I, I still don't always do this. But I have come to understand that these are some things that work and will help. And, and so the first thing I suggest that you do, even when it comes uh, to teaching uh, the perfect ten and uh, giving God's truth priority in your home, I suggest you begin by listening. By listening. Now, now of course, uh, verse 7 that we just read uh, it tells us uh, that we're to talk and that we're to share. And not that we're just supposed to tell our kids to sit still while we instill God's Word into your mind and into your life so that you'll make sure to obey God's Word. That doesn't usually work with kids. In fact, let me give you just a little hint. When it comes to girls, now, this isn't true with all girls, but, but generally, girls are apt to, at least until they get to be 13 and then it all changes, but uh, girls are, are more apt to talk freely. In other words, you can, you, you can sit down on the couch with a girl and, and have a good lengthy conversation, and, and if, if she's in the mood at the time, she will just tell you everything that happened in her day. I mean, girls can get on the phone and talk for hours about everything and nothing. They just can talk. Boys, not so much. In fact, boys like to do things. Boys like to build things. Boys like to play things. Now, not that girls don't like to do those things, and, and, and not that boys can't talk. It's just that uh, guys and gals are wired differently. Have you ever noticed that? And, and guys are more apt to talk whenever they're doing something. So, you know, if you're fixing the car and they're with you doing something, then they're more apt to open up and begin to talk. And, and they're more apt to hear and listen what you have to say. Uh, playing catch or whatever. And, and so uh, that's just a little suggestion, especially when you're raising boys when, when you want to share about what God is doing in your life, and when you want to share what God says we should do, or even share what you did <laughs> and it didn't work, there's a way that you can get to their hearts, both boys and girls. But I said, listen. I didn't say talk. I said, listen. And I guarantee you that if you'll create environments and opportunities for them to talk, they will let you know when they're ready. And I'm talking about more than just talk about sports or, you know, you know, talking about dresses. I'm talking about what's really going on on the inside, how they're really feeling, how, how 
they perceive themselves and how they perceive the world. And at those times, you, you can really talk and share about how God's principles work and, and how they, they can help us to succeed and, and how they are, are good boundaries to keep us out of trouble. Now, you need to seek to talk and listen with your kids with understanding. Now, that, that might seem obvious, but look, especially when, when they get a little older, uh, 10 or 11, even especially when they're 15 and 16, you're not going to agree with everything that they say. But I encourage you, don't, don't respond by saying, no, you shouldn't think that way. That's not right. What you should do is think the way that I think about everything. First of all, they'll stop talking to you because in their minds, you put them down. You did not value their thoughts or their opinions, even if they're way out their opinions and you can't possibly agree with them. At least listen, at least hear them out. I had occasion to give some advice to some grieving parents recently, not grieving over the death of their daughter, but grieving over what they considered to be the loss of their daughter. Because their 20-something daughter had chosen an alternate lifestyle that just didn't make sense to them. And they did not know what to do. And you know what my number one advice to them was? Let her tell you. Let her tell you what's going on. Let her tell you why. Let her tell you how she feels. Let her tell you the struggles she's having. You don't have to agree with her choices. And you can make that clear. She already knows that. But whatever you do, listen to hear what she has to say. Because if you don't keep the lines of communication open when they're in the fourth grade and when they're in their junior year of high school and when they have their first job, if you don't keep the lines of communication open, then they will shut down and ultimately cut you off as far as real meaningful, heartfelt conversation And it won't work for you, and it won't ultimately work for them. I also encourage you not only uh, seek to understand their thoughts and where they're coming from and how they're feeling, but listen with body language. In other words, it's going to bother them if, if by your body language uh, they don't think you're really tuned in. Now, that doesn't mean you have to stop everything you're doing, you know, and just focus on them, but they need to know that your number one priority at the moment is them and hearing them and talking with them. So you may have to put the paper down. You may have to turn the television off. You might miss the ball game because this happens to be one of those golden moments when they're ready to talk. And your body language and how you respond and the focus that you give will speak volumes. So, listen. I also suggest when it comes to the perfect 10 for homes that win and, and, and when it comes to uh, helping your child like Mike's parents wanted to help him, I, I encourage you to set limits. I really think that's in part what the Ten Commandments are all about. It's for God to let us know what the boundaries are. What's in bounds and what's definitely out of bounds. 
And, and, and listen to me. Most children want to know where the boundaries are because there is emotional safety for children, even teenagers, inside of the boundaries. Now, no doubt, some will push the limits. Uh, uh, some will run right past the limits. Some won't even notice the limits. They certainly don't want to hear about the limits sometimes. But boundaries do speak words of love that you can't communicate any other way. Now, one reason they need to have boundaries with you is because they may not have boundaries with those that influence them greatly, their friends. In fact, look at what it says in Proverbs uh, chapter 13 and uh, verse 20. It says, he who walks with wise men will be wise, but the companion of fools will be destroyed. And, and so part of the limits, uh, they need to understand that you need to know what's going on in their lives on a daily basis, uh, that you need to know who they're hanging out with, what they're listening to, what they're watching. I would suggest that you never put the family computer in a place where it can be privately viewed. I suggest that you always have home computers in the den, in the kitchen, where anybody and everybody sees what's going on whenever you're on the computer. Look at what it goes on to say in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 33. Don't be deceived. Evil company corrupts good habits. And so your boundaries, for them to understand the safety and the security and the rightness of staying within your limits that you set. And by the way, if you set limits, you need to keep the limits where they are. How many times have you seen a mama or a daddy in a grocery store saying to a child, if you don't stop that, this is going to happen. And they don't stop and you know good and well, nothing's going to happen. Well, then that parent just set a new boundary because the boundary is really what it is that you will keep as a boundary. Well, one reason they need such boundaries is because of the great influence that others will, will have on them. You say, Pastor Randall, you didn't trust your boys? Well, uh, yes and no. I wanted to trust them because they're my sons. And I wanted to expect and think the best out of them. Uh, but, but here's the deal. In, in Ephesians uh, chapter 2, in verse 3, it says, Among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. And so I had to understand that I, I, I wanted to trust them, but I couldn't always. Because just like me... <laughs> You know, they were born with a natural tendency to want to be their own boss and do their own thing and run past my limits and make all their choices. And, and they did that from the time that they were toddlers until they were teens. In fact, in Proverbs chapter 22 and verse 15, it says, Foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child. The rod of correction will drive them far from it. And so it, it's talking here about that the limits that you set have to be serious. And so they need to be reasonable and they need to be enforceable. So don't 
Don't set limits that you can't keep, that you don't intend to keep. And so you need to be very thoughtful and very deliberate when you set limits. Don't set limits on the run. You set limits in advance so that they understand. My mother would stop and have just a brief conversation with me before she would take me into a store when I was, you know, uh, five, six, seven years of age. And she very clearly helped me to understand the limits and I understood without her telling me what would happen if I ran past the limits. And she also talked to me about how good it would be, how I would be rewarded if I stayed within the limits that, that she was explaining. So set limits. But also, I encourage you to foster laughter in your home. It, it sounds like we just need to be super serious all the time with all of this listening and talking about spiritual things and, and all these rules and limits. But, but look at what it says in Ecclesiastes uh, chapter 3 and verse 4. Uh, there's a time for everything. Uh, uh, there, there's a time for teaching. Uh, there certainly is a time uh, for rules. Uh, there is a time to weep, it says in verse 4. And there is a time to laugh. My wife, Krista, on Saturday mornings, when my boys, especially when they were in middle school and high school, wanted to sleep, uh, she would give them a little bit of time, but then she would sneak into their rooms and start tickling them. When they were 14, 15, 17 years of age, she was still doing it. On Saturday mornings, they knew that they were going to be woken up with mama tickling them, and they, uh, they would laugh, and she knew just the, the exact... Uh, you know, tickle zones and all that kind of stuff. And, and it, it was just an example that my wife understood that there was a time just to have fun, uh, just, just to laugh. And I will tell you this, they are now in their 30s. And when we're with them, if she goes, I'm going to tickle you, there is a bodily reaction. They fear the tickle even to this day. And they laugh about it. And it has brought a lot of joy into our home. So sometimes you just need to get down and have some fun. A psychologist tell us uh, that not only do we need several hugs a day, but we need several belly laughs a day in order to be healthy in mind, body, and spirit. Now, I don't know about in your house, but in my house, Sunday was the hardest day of the week to have fun. Uh, not because... We couldn't have fun. It was just that Sunday was so busy. By the time you get up early and, and get ready for Sunday school and then church and then, you know, Sunday dinner either at home or out. And, uh, you know, out takes long. Uh, at home, you got to clean all the dishes up. And then I had to be back at the church at 4 o'clock or 4.30 for a meeting. And there was Sunday night church and there were activities after church. And so the day that should be the... The best day of the week became the worst day of the week. And so just be really careful that you plan and intentionally make Sunday, the day that we celebrate Jesus, a day to celebrate indeed and make it fun. I also encourage you to lift. Lift them up. Now, certainly you want to lift them up in prayer. You want to lift them up in prayer before they're born. You want to lift them up in prayer for their salvation. You want to lift them uh, up in prayer that they'll have the right friends, that they'll find the right spouse, uh, that they'll understand uh, the goodness of God and, and how much he loves them, and that they'll understand uh, the value of of obeying God and the great reward that comes with doing the right thing. Yes, pray that they'll understand and get all of that. But I also encourage you to praise them up. Now, 
I'm not talking about that you have to tell little Johnny that everything he does is good. You know, because not everything Johnny does is good. You, you know, we, 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 we live in the age of the participation trophy that nobody needs to be left out and everybody needs to feel good about what they did. So, so I, I'm talking about within reason and in balance. But look, we live in such a critical world and I guarantee you that at school and on the internet and just about every other place they go in the work world, perhaps in their date life, they're going to get a lot of criticism. And so they need to know that from you, they're going to get more praise than they get jabs. In fact, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 11, it says, Therefore, comfort each other and edify one another just as you are doing. The, the word edify comes from the same work, uh, uh, word as, as edifice. And, and, and you know what an edifice is, right? It's a building. And, and so what, what Paul is saying here is build each other up. Don't tear each other down. I think this ought to be a commandment for every home. That in our house, there's going to be more praise than put down. You say, oh, well, that's, that's, that's not hard. I, 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 I never, you know, say a put down to my, to my kids or to my grandkids. Never did it, wouldn't do it. Yeah, but, but when you get in an angry word battle with your spouse, that is not building up your children. In fact, when they watch and hear and see all of that, that just tears them down and puts fear into their lives that shouldn't be there. And also, you got to be careful what you say to your kids. E even innocently, you just, you just need to be careful, not what you're saying necessarily, but what you think they might be hearing from you. When, when my youngest son, Judson, uh, was a senior in high school and, and he wanted to apply to attend Baylor University, the, the one in Waco, Texas, not, not, not Baylor here, but, but the one in Waco, Texas. And uh, Baylor University in Texas is a high academic school and uh, Judson didn't have the best of grades. And, and, and so in trying to help my son, I said, Judson, you know, it, it's, it's fine for you to apply to Baylor, but I'm not sure that you've got the grades to get into Baylor, and so you ought to at least apply to some other schools because that's the only one he was applying to. Now, in my heart of hearts, I was trying to help him because I didn't want him to come up at the end of the application process and Baylor turns him down and he has no other choice. That's what I said. You know what he heard? You're not good enough. I don't think you're good enough. Now later, I apologized and he accepted, but he's never forgotten it. Parents, when I was in my 40s, I was pastoring a dynamic, growing church south of Houston, Texas. We had been recognized as one of the fastest growing churches in the state. I, I was getting invited to, to, to go places and, and, and talk about church growth. And my dad, I love him. As you know, my, my dad passed away last uh, de December. He, he called me and said, Hey, son, why don't you let me recommend you or get some of my friends to recommend you 
to some churches so that you can get into a really good church. Now, that's what he said. And I know what he meant. But that's not what I heard. I heard him say, the church you're in is not really good. And you can't get in a really good church without my help. So I'm just saying, be careful, even with your adult children, that you lift them up, that you build them up. And be careful to try your best not to tear them down. And then, I would encourage you to lead. And, and, and lead by example. Because, like we said, they're going to be influenced by their friends, and so you, you might as well influence them. Uh, look quickly at Exodus uh, uh, chapter 20 and verse 5. You'll want to see this. Exodus chapter uh, 20 and verse 5. It says, uh, for you shall bow down, talking about worshiping idols. This is one of the commandments. Uh, you shall not uh, serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the, the iniquity. Get this. Visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generation to those who hate me. Y you might read that and go, oh my goodness, what kind of a God would punish grandkids and great-grandkids because of what some foolish great-grandfather did. What kind of a God would do that? That's not what he's saying. Do you remember when Jacob uh, sort of tricked, twisted the truth with his brother and, and got the birthright got the inheritance from dad. Got his, got his brother to promise that he could have that. And, and then do you remember when, when that same uh, Jacob tricked his father by acting like he was his brother so that not only would he get the, the inheritance, but he would get the blessing from his father? And, and you think, my goodness, what kind of a son is that? Where did he learn that? He learned it from his daddy. Because you see, there was an occasion whenever his, his daddy was traveling with his wife, Rachel, and, uh, uh, excuse me, Rebecca, and what happened was he was kind of nervous that since Rebecca was so beautiful that, that some of the foreigners might just kill him so they can have her. And so he said, hey, hey, don't tell them that you're my wife. Tell them that you're my sister. So, so there was some trickery involved. You say, my goodness, how could a man do something like it influenced his son? Where did he learn how to do that? He learned that from his daddy. Because there was an occasion when his daddy, Abraham, did exactly the same thing with Sarah. Don't tell him you're my wife. Tell him you're my sister. So lead, yes, but you're going to lead by example. And what you show them by example is not just going to affect your kids. It's going to affect your grandkids and your great-grandkids and for generations because a family culture is established and that family culture continues. I was appalled just a week ago. I was, I was by myself, and I was hungry, so I went to an all-you-can-eat pizza place. Okay, I'm confessing, but here's the deal. I sat there and watched a man walk in with his two teenage daughters. And not only did he have sharp elbows to where any time a pizza came out, he would come... A rush and, and get about three-fourths of the pizza and pile it up that high and put a plate on top of it and take it back. And everybody else would come up and go, whoa, whoa, whoa what happened? When they got ready to leave, he, he told them to go ahead and leave, and they went out to the car, and he stayed. And he went and got an entire pizza pan, took it to his table, took all the pizza out, 
put it on a plate, covered it with a plate, and then watched and waited until the manager and the other workers weren't looking and he scampered out. And I thought to myself, oh my soul, what he is teaching his daughters. It's going to affect his world like he can't believe it. And you need to love them. You need to love God supremely. Love your wife or your husband, your spouse, secondly, but love your children specifically. And that love needs to be unconditional, not based on their performance. Now, you, you need to deal with their performance, and if their performance isn't good, then you certainly need to address it. But they need to understand that this is not like sports. Uh, you know, to where you've got to perform well to get picked, and then you've got to perform well to stay on the team, and you've got to perform well to play, and if you don't, you're on the bench. Y you can't treat kids when you're raising them that way. In fact, uh, Scripture tells us very clearly in Proverbs chapter 22 and verse 6, Train up your child in the way that they should go. And when they're old, they will not depart from it. Now, uh, I could spend uh, another 30 minutes. I won't, but I could spend another 30 minutes on that verse. But let me, let me point out something that, that maybe normally is not pointed out. Train up a child in the way he should go. The way she should go. Not the way he should go, but the way he should go. Because you see, every child is a mystery. Every child is different. Every child has a different plan that God has for them. And if we as parents decide this is what they ought to be, this is where they ought to succeed, this is where they ought to go to college, this is how they ought to get a scholarship, this is what their job, their vocation should be, then we're not training them in the way that he should go. So it's not about fulfilling your dreams for them or about them making all the right decisions and perform in such a way that it pleases you. No. No. You teach them to please God, whatever they're doing, and then rejoice when they do it right. Love them unconditionally. Love them unselfishly. They're not always going to appreciate your love, so love them unselfishly and love them unwavering. No matter how much they mess up. Now, you can't overlook it, but... Um, They need to know, even when you discipline them, that you love them. One last thing. When my wife was about fourth grade, she messed up. She was a good child, rarely broke the rules, but she did this time. And her father set her down before he was about to spank her. And by the way, this is not a discussion about spanking. There are there are certainly other ways to discipline kids. Uh, I don't think spanking in the right way is wrong, but if you don't want to spank, then just discipline them however is going to work for you. But my father-in-law spanked. Now, never in anger and never in abuse. There's no excuse for that. But if you're disciplining, even spanking, to help change behavior then you're doing it in the right way. He gave her the whole story, you know. This just hurts me so much. I don't want to spank you. It hurts me more to spank you than it does to get... You've heard that, right? He said, but I'm not going to spank you today. You're going to spank me. You disobeyed. But I want to show you how much I love you. I'm going to take the punishment for you. Here's the belt. She started weeping. 
he had her take the belt and try to spank him a little bit, crying all the way through. Now, that was his way that day of saying, it's not about your performance. It's about how much I love you. And then lean. Lean on God, certainly. <laughs> know him intimately. Tough times are the perfect time to show your children that Christianity is for real. How else are they going to know it unless you're faithful and love God and appreciate him, even through the tough times? That's how they learn it. But I also encourage you to lean on others. So make sure you're in a small group of believers that can support you through this whole parenting thing. So, who is Mike going to marry? I have no idea, and neither do you. But I know this. If his parents have done these seven things, there's a good chance he'll make the right decision. Let's pray. Thank you for watching Standing on the Word. We invite you to be with us each Sunday morning at 1045 and every Sunday evening at 6 o'clock. The South Seminole Baptist Church is located at 1201 South Seminole Drive in East Ridge, Tennessee. We invite you to join us and together we will share in Standing on the Word.